Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody today to the annual meeting of the uh, Yarra Drug and Health Forum. I'd like to uh, welcome those that are for the first time to uh, one of our meetings. I'd all like, also like to uh, welcome those that are regular attenders and uh, uh, long-time supporters of the Yarra Drug and Health Forum. Uh, it's a beautiful day and uh, we're really, really pleased to have uh, uh, John Fain, who's been a long-term friend of the uh, Yarra Drug and Health Forum as a guest speaker. But before we make a start, I'd like to ask um, Uncle Colin Hunter, who's a Rundry elder and also a long-time friend and supporter of the Yarra Drug and Health Forum, to do a welcome to country. So over to you, Uncle Colin. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Look, I'd like to start off by acknowledging that this afternoon we are meeting on the lands of my ancestors, the Wurundjeri people. And I want to take this opportunity to pay my respects to my oldest folk past, President Emerging, elders from all nations. But I particularly want to pay my respects to everyone gathered this afternoon. Woman Jacob, are welcome. Wurundjeri Bullock, Eamon Condi Big. The Wurundjeri people welcome everyone to land today. Wurundjeri, no, 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 Bunnambal War, Condi Nangnak, Dubin Big, Bullock Boar, Tilikin. The Wurundjeri people want you to look out to protect the land as they did long before. Wurundjeri country extends from the inner city of Melbourne, it goes across the mountains of the Great Dividing Range west to the Werribee River, south to the Mordialic Creek and east to Mount Borbor. And the Wurundjeri people are part of the Kulin Nation and of the Wurundjeri language group. Hello, my name is Colin Hunter Jr. or Willert, many possum. A name given to me by my grandmother as a young boy. I'm a proud and passionate seventh generation Wurundjeri man and a direct descendant of Bibigen, who was Nellan Getter, or head of the tribe at time at first settlement. And it's through my grandmother, Gumbra, meaning white dove, or only tiny or nana she was known to us, mob, that have got Aboriginal culture and heritage in my life today, so for that I say thanks, Nan. My grandmother was one of the last of the Aboriginal people born in the early 1920s, up at Corrandoke Mission in Hillsville, before she got pushed up the barrel on the river in New South Wales. In Aboriginal culture, a great deal of respect is given to the land, the plants and the animals alike. And while you're on Wurundjeri country, you're most welcome to the traditional lands and the waterways of the Wurundjeri people. So, woman, check a welcome. Look, before I go, I just thought I'd take an opportunity to um, acknowledge and celebrate that we're, we're in the middle of NADOC week, which is um, a bit strange this year. We usually would have it early in the year in July, but, you know, with COVID-19 COVID and all the, the restrictions we've had, to, we've had to wait till later in the year. And I suppose, you know, for, for me, NODOC's a, an opportunity to showcase and showcase our history, our culture, our people. You know, I think I was only reading the other day about Frankie Ray. I think he's an Aboriginal man. He won the, he won the Melbourne Cup. I'm not, I'm not sure what year it was, but, you know, and the theme always was be, always always was, always will be, you know. And I'm, I was saying something to the other day about that. That's a that's a sixty thousand year old theme, you know. Always was, always will be. You know, I was saying yesterday I had the NADOC award, and I was saying to the young kids, I said, you know, I've got full confidence in the young mob that's coming behind us. You know, you know, there's some really smart kids. You know, I know Margaret Anise is only a, she's a she's a dentist, she's twelfth average old dentist in the country. So I'm sure that you know this young mob that's coming up behind us, the future leaders, they'll keep that theme strong, and we're not going nowhere. We're not going nowhere. Look, enjoy enjoy your AGM, and thanks for your time. Bye bye. Thanks, Cole. Thank you, Uncle Cole. Um. Again, welcome everybody to the meeting and thank you again, Uncle Colin, for that uh, uh, welcome to country. And um, I'd also like to say that we are all meeting on Aboriginal land somewhere where we are. And uh, on behalf of everyone, we would pay our respects to the traditional leadership 
elders of that country, wherever we are, and acknowledge the uh, enormous cultural, social and spiritual debt that we owe um, Aboriginal people and eldership and leadership across this, this great brown land of ours and look forward to the day when Aboriginal, uh, uh, Aboriginal culture and Aboriginal stewardship is recognised in our constitution and appropriate reparations are paid. This is not given land, this is stolen land that we meet on and it needs to be put right. So we acknowledge that and we acknowledge uh, uh, the, great, the great work of people like un Uncle Colin Hunter. So today is the annual meeting of the Yarra Drug and Health Forum. You're going to hear about the work over the past year that the uh, forum has undertaken through uh, uh, various folk. Um, but before we get to that, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. John Fain. Now, John's uh, well known to everybody here and uh, through his work on 774 uh, over the last 20 odd years, 25 years, as the uh, morning breakfast host, uh, morning, uh, morning host. And um, John retired last year to great uh, acclaim, but he's continued his public profile in I think uh, quite uh, uh, poignant and meaningful and quite thought-provoking uh, opinion pieces in the, uh, in the age and also being what I would say is a public intellectual and a public conscience of our community. And uh, when, I, when John kindly agreed to speak today, I asked John to think about in sort of an Old Testament prophet sort of way what, what society is going to look like coming out of COVID-19. What is community going to be? Because it's taken a bit of a battery. And uh, it would have been tempting to get John to think about uh, the world with what's going on in America and other places, but I've confined him to uh, Victoria, maybe Australia, with a little bit. So it's with great pleasure and uh, great respect that I welcome uh, John Fain to uh, speak to us all. So welcome, John. Thank you, Peter. And can I also... Uh, thank all the representatives of the First Nations people whose land we meet on and not just pay my respects and thank Colin, but also express my personal impatience for a treaty or treaties. And until we come to terms through some process, whether it's truth and reconciliation or whatever else is deemed to be appropriate, until we come to grips with that, we can't repair the damage that's been done in the foundation of the incredibly privileged society that's been built on the, the massacres, the dispossession, the rapes, the torture, and all the other things that happened and were unremarkable apparently at the time of colonial settlement of what we call Australia. And I'd like to be uh, unrestrained in my affection and my pride in my country, but I can't be until those terrible things are uh, come to grips with. We were lied to when we were taught at school and we're still lying to ourselves a bit now. But more on that maybe some other time. Uh, I've known Peter Wern a long time since he used to run around in inappropriately small shorts on a television set for a show that I was somewhat bizarrely asked to host, which was kind of like teenagers doing Q&A 25 years ago for the ABC. Uh, I don't recommend you go through to YouTube or the archives to look for it, but... Uh, uh, we've stayed in touch and I think I'm the richer for it. And Peter, I um, pay tribute to your remarkable work. You've asked me to speak about the, the community post-COVID and um, to talk about profits and public intellectuals. I'm profoundly appropriate because I don't think of myself as either. I can't play those roles and I don't try to, but if I can reflect out loud on some of the things I'm sure you're all thinking about and talking about and then answer some of your questions, which Peter's offered to moderate through the, the chat function. Um, the first thing is I'd say that um, I, I often rail when people talk about the media does this and the media does that and we don't have a media, we have multiple media and I always bristled when people said, oh, you know, the media's done this, that or the other. And I go, hang on, don't put me in the same basket as the Herald Sun or 60 Minutes or Today Tonight or whatever other uh, 
tabloid trash we were talking about at the time. There's not one media, there's a whole diversity of media and each of them does the job that they seek to do and they do it as best as they can and thinking that they are in touch with their audience and how best to communicate ideas to them. Some of them do it for different reasons. Some do it in order to make money out of advertising, out of attracting eyeballs and eardrums and, you know, everybody is their target audience as long as they can bring you in in order to make money to monetize the attention that they seek to get from you. And they do that sometimes by being tacky and tawdry and coarse and, uh, you know, whatever else they need to do. I've often thought it's like sticking a, a, a stick, putting a stick in an ant's nest and watching all the ants scurry around. And, you know, if you go out there and you, you inflame a situation as tabloid media often do, then, you know, I guess springs and roundabouts, you stir up trouble and then you take the credit for calming it down. I worked for a very long time and was very privileged to be a small link in a very honourable chain at the ABC. So we don't exist to make money for the, the proprietors. We, we don't exist in order to try and accumulate a mass audience in whatever way we can. We existed according to a different set of values. And that's the same with community. So if you ask what does community look like post-COVID, well, there isn't one community. Every single one of the 25 people who are participating in this meeting, every one of you have multiple communities and you participate in different ways at different times in different communities. You've got neighbourhoods, you've got families, you've got friends, you've got workplaces, you've got sporting affiliations, you've got religious affiliations, you might have political affiliations, you may have hobbies that you're heavily involved in. And each of those is a community. There might be some overlap. There might be a gap, a massive gap sometimes between who you are in one community and who you are in another community because we play roles in our lives. You may be one person when you go to the football and that person's unrecognisable compared to the person you are when you're at work. That's not unusual. In fact, often people go to the football in order to lose themselves, in order to be a different version of themselves. So there's not one community to look at post-COVID. There's a whole range of communities, and some of those communities have been strengthened by this extraordinary pandemic, and some have been weakened through this pandemic. And even when we bury down another layer, if you look at families, some families have been united by the pandemic and others have split apart. Some people finding they're spending more and more time with their spouse, their partner, their children, their parents, whatever it might be, they've loved it. Some people have hated it. Some people have loved these virtual meetings on Zoom. They've adapted to them, readily taken it up, enjoyed it, enjoyed the fact that you can be dressed from the waist up and you can be doing all sorts of other things and there's 25 of you and... Who knows, a whole lot of you have blanked out your cameras and you could be sitting there doing the crossword puzzle or whatever else it might be and you can be present whilst you're not present. You can be multitasking. You could be on five different Zoom meetings at once and no one would know. So you can be incredibly efficient. People have found all sorts of ways of grabbing the opportunity and exploiting it. Other people have curled up into a ball and gone into the corner and howled at the moon. There's no universal experience. One of the things that particularly irritates me, in fact, as I consume a lot of media still and, and knowing some of the kind of, you know, the, the sausage machine making that goes on behind the scenes, one of the things that really annoys me at the moment is everyone's talking about the economy, but every time I see on television or newspapers, radio, wherever, I see people talking about the economy and they constantly talk to someone who runs a restaurant, a cafe, or who's a tourism operator. It's not the economy. The economy is not cafes, restaurants and tour operators. That's discretionary spending. The economy is everything else. It's manufacturing, it's farming, it's services industries, as we know, a massive part of the Victorian and Melbourne economy. The economy is not people in restaurants who are bemoaning the fact that, you know, they can't have as many patrons as they'd like to or they have to serve people outside on a day which is windy with hay fever rampant as today is. 
And I get really cross because I'm going, I'm, I'm turning into one of those middle-aged men who shouts at the television or shouts at the radio and goes, ah, why do you keep doing this? And the answer is obvious when you bury into it. The answer is because those people are readily av available and they'll say something that will attract a reaction. They're not going to always say, oh, everything's fabulous, we're doing really well. They're going to say, ah, this is a disaster and if it, le if it bleeds, it leads. It's always the same. Bad news is always better for the media than good news. So we've got this kind of distorted effect as we have a look at how communities are dealing with the pandemic. I could rattle off a list of half a dozen businesses and people I know who have told me that they have had record turnover. They've never been busier. They've made a fortune so far from the pandemic. Their business has been underwritten by the taxpayers and they're going to have to give some money back because all their predictions of collapsed turnover have proven to be wrong. And rather than wait for the tax office to come knocking and to be audited, they're going to volunteer that, in fact, hang on, we put our hands up for JobKeeper and the rest of it, but it turned out we didn't need it. There are people who have made record had record turnover, not just from online, but from deliveries as well. So things aren't as terrible as they make out. There's been some really good things that have come out of it. And in this company, I'm sure I'll have unanimous agreement that it's been fabulous having the pokies venues shut for the last several months. And I was so disappointed that the casino is allowed to reopen. I was looking forward to it staying shut well, given James Packer's recent evidence to the New South Wales inquiry, it might have stayed shut forever until they can sort out finding owners who pass the ethical threshold and the barriers that he's clearly failing to cross. So it's not all bad news. In fact, the economy is awash with money. There is more money in Australian financial institutions and banks than ever. The government's been pumping it in and there's been very little to spend it on. Take just my own family. We were going to be travelling post-ABC. We were looking forward to an extended European tour this year. We put aside an outrageous amount of money in order to uh, travel to Europe and swan around for the, the big trip. It's all in the bank. And lots of other people have had exactly the same experience. And, of course, to replace your overseas trips wherever they might have been, people are going to be travelling locally and you can't get accommodation anywhere at the moment domestically in Australia for love or money, no matter what you want to do. So I want to go through the positives and the negatives, but I want to acknowledge that a lot of the doom and gloom I've found to be quite puzzling. One of the lasting effects of COVID, though, is a return to localism. Now, I mentioned before and first named was one of the communities that I referred to is neighbourhood. And I think what we've seen from COVID so far, particularly, but not exclusively in the big cities, but also in regional centres and even in smaller regional towns, is a reappreciation of localism. And suddenly your bubble, your, your space bubble, and at the moment it's 25 k's, but for a while it was much less, and your neighbourhood where you could walk and who you could interact with became incredibly local. And that became your focus. And the number of people who just in my own circles, and they're much broader than you might otherwise think, the number of people who have said, oh, I've never knew so much about my neighbours, about I've seen gardens I've never noticed before. I've always driven past them. Now I'm walking past them. I've rediscovered the local shops. I've rediscovered the local fruit and veg. I've rediscovered this, that and the other. And it's magnified that across the whole of not just metropolitan Melbourne but right around Australia. And I think there is, and I hope there is, an ongoing uh, a rediscovery and a reappreciation of localism in all of that. And if that's of lasting um, benefit, then I think you'll see the economic fallout of that as well. I mean, sadly, I, I, I cross town and all through the lockdown, I've been able to cross town because I twice a week am a carer for my 94-year-old parents who still live at home, even though they'd probably be better off in care. They don't want to go into care. So the family have said, all right, we'll, we'll keep you going at home for as long as we possibly can. So twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays, I jump in the car and I head across town. And I've been doing that every week since we had COVID in, at the end of March. Punt Road was a breeze. I loved it. I could go from here to my parents who live in Armadale and the house they bought in 1968. I could go there without even touching the brakes sometimes. It was fabulous. 
And yet just yesterday I had to do it again and it was a nightmare. And I, the first thing I thought was, oh, please, could we bring back some travel restrictions? Get these people out of the way. Get those kids back learning from home. This is awful, horrible. I loved it when there was no traffic. Of course, I am the traffic. It's not just everybody else is the traffic. I'm the traffic from their point of view. You know, from my point of view, they're all a nuisance. From their point of view, I'm a nuisance. But, hey, I feel I've got a legitimate reason and, and, you know, what are all these other people doing? They should get off the road. But this rediscovery of localism, I suspect, is going to, it's going to last. It'll stay on because people have discovered they like their neighbourhood. That's why they live where they live. And if they didn't know much about their neighbourhood, they've explored it. And they've, by and large, I mean, we're incredibly lucky. By and large, it's it's scrubbed up. One of the other things, and this is really interesting, and I don't pretend to have the answer, is some kind of doubting of authority in a way we've never seen before. There's always been people who don't like government. There's always been people who are suspicious of authority. But we've had a crisis in the last several years. It's been an ethics and trust crisis. We've had a a loss of trust in clergy, police, politicians, all sorts of decision makers. But now, sadly, we have to add science and medicine to the list of things that people for some reason feel that they can doubt and not trust. We saw it with climate science and scepticism there, but now we're seeing it also in relation to COVID. But I do want to sound a note of caution because a lot of that I think is exaggerated. There's a false equivalence between the small number of loud and ugly voices that are doubting the health and medical warnings on COVID compared to the 95, 97, 98, whatever it is, percent compliance. Now, no one goes around saying 97% of the people are complying. Instead, you get a couple of hundred idiots outside the shrine or in the city square or whatever, and they get a lot of attention. It's always been thus. That's not new. But what we've got now with social media in particular is that we've got people being able to use platforms that previously weren't available to them in order to propagate some of this nonsense. We've always had conspiracy theories, you know, they never landed on the moon, Elvis is still alive, there was another shooter on the grassy knoll, you know, I can keep on going, oh, Hitler's still alive in South America. There's any number of them. They've always been loonies and there's always been conspiracy theories, but they've always been loonies, they've been on the fringe. And now with social media and the collapse of some of the traditional mainstream media and gatekeepers, we've now got people who ought be on the fringe, who have been trying to mainstream themselves. But again, I think there's an exaggeration of how much importance, significance and influence they have. I don't think the fact that Sky News is on with, you know, 10,000 viewers, I don't think it means that much. A lot of those people have just got the television on as wallpaper and they're not taking much notice. A lot of those people are already, they're not, no one's mind is being changed. People tune in because they're already committed to a particular perspective or point of view. And then the social media, people say, oh, look, you know, people on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, like hundreds of thousands of followers. Well, the sad reality is that of all 26 of you who are part of this annual general meeting right now, uh, we're approaching, what is it, two o'clock, but by five o'clock this evening, you could all have 100,000 followers if you want on Twitter. You can go online and buy 100,000 followers and they will be added to your account on Facebook or Twitter and suddenly you look like someone who's really important and whose opinions really matter and who's incredibly influential, even though all you are is someone who flew a, threw a credit card at some troll factory in probably India who manufactured 100,000 fictional followers so that you boosted your profile. It's bullshit. It doesn't mean anything. And the other thing is that a lot of these organisations, they put out videos and they put out all sorts of nonsense on social media and they say, oh, we had, you know, 30,000 people watch this video. Well, I'm sorry to be the one to break the news to everybody, but it doesn't matter how many people start watching the video because you can, again, set a robot, you can set a computer to go click, 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 click thousands of times. The only static statistic that matter, the only uh, relevant piece of data is what's called the completion rate on those videos. And uh, videos on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, whatever other platform you'd care to like, they're notorious for having incredibly low completion rates. Like I'm talking 1% completion, sometimes less than 1%, but rarely more than 10%. And that's because people use technological trickery 
to try and make their material popular when it isn't or to make it appear to be popular when it isn't. So there's a lot of nonsense out there and there's this false equivalence between the genuine story and the facade of a story. And I'll give you, just before we get to your questions in a few minutes, I'll get to the best example I can give you, which is one that's personally um, come to me. In about June, as we went past that three-week period where we had first wave and we went into a period of relative openness and we just started to realise we were being hit with the second wave, I made a um, friendly phone call to someone who I've dealt with and worked with professionally at the health department for a very long time. And I rang her and she's in the comms side uh, and I've dealt with her over many years from the ABC. And I said, you know, your, your ads to try and stop this second wave, they're really not very effective. First of all, they're a bit, I'm sorry, boring. They're very conservative and they're not cutting through. You're not ever going to change someone's mind with a, you know, a, a doctor in um, a mask and gloves saying, oh, please take this seriously. It's just not going to persuade anybody. might look good, but it's not going to achieve much. And I just thought I was helping her out and she said, oh, well, you know, what should we do instead? And I said, oh, well, you, you've got to use a bit of humour and you've got to use a bit of carrot instead of stick instead of just kind of, you know, wagging your finger at people. And uh, I thought I was just giving her some ideas and then she got back to me and she said, could you write down some of that stuff into an email so I can show it to other people? And I said, yeah, sure. So I wrote her a one-page email saying, why don't you try doing some of this, 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 this and this? And then I didn't hear anything for a week and then I heard back from her and she said, can you expand on that and turn it into a proposal? And I said, I don't know, what's a proposal look like? And she said, well, just, just expand on it. Just explain in more detail. Your one page needs to be two pages so we can take it to the secretary. So I put on a, in a proposal. I didn't know what a proposal was, but I made one up and expanded on it and said, you could do this, that and the other. And then she came back to me a few days later and said, can you put a budget to it and then we might commission them. So. I've, you know, I mean, the great irony here is that I'm being asked to make some ads and I've worked for 30 years in an organisation that doesn't do ads and doesn't welcome ads and it's foreign territory for me, but I knew who to speak to and I got some back of the envelope figures and put something to them and they said, okay, fine, you're on. How fast can you do them? So you might have seen the Magda Zabansky, Matt Preston, Shane Jacobson. There's a series of eight ads that we did and we made them in three weeks. And we worked flat out. I mean, I worked, you know, 18-hour days for 20 days in a row, as did lots of other people, and we pulled them together and we got celebrities who normally you have to book up months ahead. I mean, if you ask Magda to do something, normally you go through an agent and you spend weeks and weeks and weeks negotiating over a fee. And Walid Ali and Nazim Hussain and um, uh, the, the team from Mangrook Footy Show, uh, Michelle Payne, the Melbourne Cup jockey who'd just finished shooting a Maya catalogue of all things, you know, we used, and Taylor Harris, the footballer, and Mo Hope. So we got all these people, Shane Jacobson, you know, really busy just doing the full Monty on television, Matt Preston just building up to another TV show on cooking. I just rang them and said, we're doing these emergency ads for the health department. Do you want to be in? And every one of them said, you bet. And we had them like I rang Magda on Thursday. We filmed her on Monday. I rang Matt and Shane on Friday. We filmed them on Tuesday. And it just went bang, bang, bang like that. Now, when those ads came out, they had 1.4 million views in less than a week on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. 1.4 million in less than a week. And they went viral. They just exceeded anybody's expectations. And just saying a simple message to people, you know, follow the rules, wear a mask, do the right thing, and we can get this thing beat. And then the trolls piled on and people started trolling Magda for being fat. I wouldn't take a health message from someone as fat as you. And they did the same to Shane Jacobson. Nobody else got trolled, just Magda and Shane. And then the trolls started getting attention. And suddenly the ads were described as controversial. There's nothing controversial about them at all. They're incredibly and wildly successful. But suddenly there was a second and, you know, forever grateful. We got another burst of interest from the fact that some of the people presenting some of the ads were being trolled. And then there was a bit of a wash up and they got written up in The Guardian and they got played on Gruen and Media Watch. All sorts of people followed on and thank you very much. It helped get the message across. 
But this false equivalence again came out. So a couple of thousand trolls were regarded as just as important as millions of viewers. And they're not. They're nothing like each other. A couple of thousand trolls is nothing like millions of people getting the message through the social media platforms. So it was a really interesting phenomenon where you see the distorting effect of social media. Of course, huge numbers of people have nothing to do with social media and increasingly there's people segmenting their social media. I mean, it's only journalists who consume more than one or two types. Most people are sensible enough to say, oh, look, I'll use Instagram or I'll use Facebook or I'll use TikTok or whatever it might be. Some people don't use any of them. But it was a really interesting, from my point of view, because I was on the receiving end this time, it was a really interesting example of what I was talking about before, about how things get distorted and get out of hand. So let's get to questions. Just to summarise, though, where are we post-COVID? Well, there's communities. Some of them are strengthened and some are weakened. Our governments are being asked to support the ones that have found themselves under stress, and that's a good thing. I think the federal and state governments, by and large, have been quite remarkable, not perfect, not by any means perfect. But you look at where other countries are, we have been very well served, and I think that's buttressed people's faith in government. We've seen that with the ACT election, the Queensland election, the New Zealand election, the Queensland election, you know, all of these different tests of public sentiment have shown us very clearly that people think they've done a decent job and they should be given credit to it. So I think there'll be some lasting benefits, there'll be some deficits, there'll be some people who are hurt, there are some sectors like education, foreign students that have been hurt, and they will need investing. So let's look and see what Dan Andrews' budget does, let's see what the effect of Josh Frydenberg's stimulus is going to be, and let's keep on working together as our communities emerge from the stress test that we've all been through. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thanks, John. Look, um, we've said that, uh, yeah, people are clapping, uh, the Zoom clap or whatever it is. John, while we're waiting for people to uh, put their hands up or ask questions, um, do you think it's changed the economic framework of how, I mean, prior to, uh, to COVID, governments couldn't, you know, no one wanted to have deficits, not even the Labor Party thought deficits were an they were a dirty word deficits. Now no one's worrying about deficits. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think um, that's changed the uh, zeitgeist of thinking around economics and of the need to actually think differently about how we spend money for the commonwealth of our community? Yes and yes. And how fortunate is it that COVID came tri triggering an economic crisis at a time when global interest rates were virtually zero. Imagine if global interest rates were 5%, 10%, 15%. The attitude now is, well, throw another billion on the barbie. Who the hell cares? Free kinder next year, you know, whatever else it might be. And it won't matter because we can borrow this money within the existing ceilings and limits that we'd already set for repaying debt because interest rates have completely collapsed. Governments can borrow money for, you know, a quarter of a percent. I can't, you can't, although you can borrow money for less than ever before. And then you've got this extraordinary phenomenon of the, the, uh, the super funds, the industry super funds, and I should declare an interest. I've given some advice to Industry Super Australia and, and I think it's a, an amazing organisation. But they've got one and a half trillion dollars and they're wondering what they can spend it on so that they can have the returns to the fund that guarantee you've got an income when you retire. So they're desperate to invest in things that create jobs for people who become their members or are already their members, which means they contribute more money, which keeps the virtuous circle going. They don't want to invest in, you know, toll roads in, you know, France or Canada or whatever. They'd rather invest in renewable energy, social housing, all the things that need doing in Australia, including infrastructure, which will pay a return over 10, 20, 30 years. It's what's called patient capital. And they're saying, well, if, if we spend money on a railway line, will it give us a return for how many decades that we can then use to support the people who are our members? And in the building of it, we can support the people who are doing the building who will become our members. 
So it's got multiple benefits. It provides infrastructure that's needed, jobs for people who are our members and retirement funds for people who are our members. What can possibly go wrong? So instead of infrastructure being built by people like a Canadian pension fund who invest heavily in Australia, we can go and invest in a solar farm and provide renewable energy. We can invest in social housing where the government will guarantee us a return to provide a solution to homelessness. And we've shown, and I think this is worth more than a passing remark, suddenly all the rough sleepers in Melbourne have been accommodated for the last few months. Mm. Wow. Mm. That's a problem that we were told could not be solved. Suddenly it can be solved and not by throwing billions at it, but by redeploying some of the money that was already being thrown at it and doing it in a different way with some compulsion, which for some people was difficult, but the vast majority of people went, you beauty, how good is this? We can do these things when we set our minds to it. We can, and we need to do it more. Yeah, there's a question uh, from uh, Nick. The question is uh, regarding community groups and an increasing insistence from the uh, Charities Commission that community groups not be political. What's your question, Nick? Um, yeah, I, I guess I was just, uh, there's been an increase on, um, on an expectation of community groups to not engage in political activities. Um, uh, friends that are uh, on boards of other community organisations other than Yarra Drug Health Forum have had to uh, siphon through their social media feeds and find any retweet of a political party because it might be considered as supporting one particular political party, even when it's something that is about their, their core interests and things like that. And it, it just... Uh, it it seems. Um, I, I mean, what what are we doing if we're not if we're not engaging in in political action? I'm somebody who thinks that a lot of action is political at its core. So, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about that. And there's nothing new about this, Nick. And it's a really important question. And it's terrific that you asked it. Uh, between 1984, five, six, and seven, I was a lawyer at Fitzroy Legal Service, and back then a Labor government was starting to put clauses into our funding contracts saying that we were supposed to stick to delivering legal services and we should confine our law reform and lobbying to particular areas because they didn't appreciate it when we came out and said we thought they were doing shit stuff. It's only ever got more and more intense ever since and that continues to this very day. And, in fact, at federal and state level, there's more and more imposition on organisations. And... I understand from the point of view of politicians, they're control freaks and they can't, you know, they're very thin skinned, they can't cope. But then what you have to do is just, you have to be innovative. So you set up separate organisations, you set up umbrella bodies, you set up ways where what needs to be said can be said. And sometimes it's the same individuals, but you just put on a different hat and you say, okay, I'm not wearing my government funded hat. I'm wearing my independent umbrella body hat here or my independent membership hat or whatever it might be. And you find ways around it. But the tendency for bureaucrats, federal and state, and politicians, federal and state, and it's not just the conservative side of politics, it's just as vicious coming the other way, uh, I don't think that's about to change. So you can rant and rave, and I did, and I still do say how inappropriate it is, but at the same time I, I think, you know, you've got to choose your battles and that's one you're unlikely to win. And I might quickly say I don't think the Greens are pure on this either. Um, if, for instance, you are wanting to challenge some of the supposed uh, unassailable truths of green political action, you find yourself the, on the receiving end of a pile on as well. And, you know, this, this um, loss of preparedness to respect other people's point of view and understand the complexity of some issues, I think is very, very regrettable. It, I don't like it at all. I think, um, you know, that the tribalism that's creeping into so many things, we've seen it supercharged in the States in this election, but uh, the fact that, you know, I, I I've got friends who are conservative politicians and we, you know, if we sit down and have a spaghetti together, we abuse each other roundly, test each other, um, try and undo each other, but we stay friends. You know, you learn a lot from having your worldview challenged. If the only people you ever mix with are people who agree with you, I think that's a very dangerous thing. Yeah, is there a final question for John before we have to say goodbye to him? One final question. Yes, he. Hi, John. Great to finally see you face to face one of these days. Um, and thank you for gracing us at the Yarra Drug and Health Forum. 
John, um, I just wondered uh, in the context of what you spoke about in terms of balancing the voices and how we emerge from the crisis and that as a community, we are now locally focused and somewhat united, but I feel that there's this tendency to fall back to what used to be. And I, I see that beginning to return already. And my question to you is, have you thought about how we manage to keep that momentum, you know, how we could keep that momentum going forward together? Sure, sure. and it's a really, it's, it's crucial. You're absolutely right to identify it as vital. Um, progress is neither inevitable nor linear. In other words, things don't just happen along a nice, smooth, straight line. They just don't. It's rough and tumble. Sometimes you go backwards before you can go forward. Sometimes you get distracted and diverted off to a little cul-de-sac. And it's not inevitable. You have to make it happen. You have to actually force the pace of change. Now, how you do that, you can either do it through a kind of Trumpian, dystopian attempt to impose your will on people, or you can do the opposite, which is, I'm sure, what's going to, to, to work with all the people participating today, which is you, you do it by empowering people, by explaining things to people, by being endlessly patient and resourceful with people and bringing them along with you rather than beating them around the ears and saying this is what you have to do. The lesson from some of those US states where people you know, John Howard used to say, you can't fatten a pig on market day. You can't turn up the week before an election and say to everyone, you have to vote. If you want people to vote two years from now in the Victorian state election or 18 months or 12 months from now in the federal election that's going to be held, every day right now is where that's going to matter. You can't just go and put something in people's letterbox, virtual or physical, the week before and say, hey, do something for me. You build those relationships all the time and you do it sincerely and with substance rather than just abusing people by treating them as a commodity that you just, I don't care what you think, I just want you to vote for me sort of thing. That can't work. I mean, it's true that the most, the most used Google search last election was who should I vote for on the day people putting that into Google on their phones while they're standing with a sausage in the queue. I cannot believe it. That's clearly not a good thing. I, I'm a supporter of compulsory voting, but it's grassroots organisations and the work that all of you do in being respectful within your community and building lasting relationships, which will ultimately pay off. Look, uh, I'd just like to uh, thank you, John. I don't know how we do this uh, without making a noise. On behalf of everybody in the meeting today, we would all like to thank you. And um, thank I've, you. I've been a, uh, an avid listener and uh, respecter of your work for many decades now. And thank you. And, uh, and I, I will always say this, that one of the things that keeps our community strong is... Uh, People like you and the contribution that people like you have made in the in the public forums of debate and uh, keeping the bastards honest. And you've certainly kept a lot of bastards honest, John. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to uh, keeping our relationship you, with you uh, strong and healthy in the future and look forward to uh, hearing more from you in the, all these public forums that you uh, work in at the, at, at the moment. So thank you once again, John. Thank you, Peter, but thank all of you for the work that you do, which I don't need to tell you how important it is. You already know, but I just uh, I thank you for it again sincerely. Thank you. Have a great meeting. Cheers. Thanks, mate. Jonathan. Well, what a, what a, what a, what a, positive, uh, a positive note to, um, to, uh, to, uh, to begin on from Uncle Colin and then, uh, and then uh, John, sort of elders in different ways in our community. Um, we're just going to morph into um, the rest of the agenda. Normally at this stage, we would have uh, the Worker of the Year Award presentation. And 
this year is a little bit different. We do have a Worker of the Year award uh, for this past year, but it's not going to be awarded today. We've we've decided to uh, hold it over till it can be done in person at, in a in a meeting. So we're not going to announce that Worker this year at the moment today. We also thought um, after a bit of discussion that it would be an important thing to acknowledge a a collective acknowledgement of the worker of the year, and that is to all the people working in harm reduction AAD services across the city of Yarra, people that work at Inner Space, people that work at the injecting room, people who work at YSAS, people who work at uh, St Vincent's Hospital in the mental health and drug and alcohol uh, services, people who work at Harm Reduction Victoria, people who work in all those aspects, people that work in, in all those services that have made such an amazing impact in such difficult circumstances on saving and protecting lives during COVID-19, directly and indirectly on some of the most um, stigmatised and vulnerable, vulnerable members of our community. And we want to applaud the work of everybody from uh, the most youngest and inexperienced of those workers to senior management that have made sure those services run. And uh, this whole year has been one about reducing harm. And COVID-19 has rem reminded us that we are in a, a practice of reducing harm and saving lives. And I just hear the lessons from in my lifetime of the work of HIV AIDS prevention. I think of the work of uh, some amazing people in that area. And earlier in this year, we had the absolute privilege of uh, Professor Margaret Hamilton and um, uh, Vera Boston, uh, John Ryan, uh, Councillor Amanda Stone and others remind us of the rich tradition of harm reduction in our, in our world, in Yarra, a 35-year rich history of that work. And we stand on the, on the shoulders of giants in this area and we want to acknowledge that that tradition of, of hard work, quiet work, selfless work has been carried on by many, many people in many, many settings across Yarra. And so for today, the award for the Worker of the Year goes to everybody in Yarra that has worked collectively and selflessly together to save lives. And, and so congratulations to everyone in Yarra that has done that. We will make a further announcement probably in the new year about the individual award winner and, uh, and we just want to make sure that that's a special award that's done in an appropriate way in a public meeting because that, that is a special moment for that person. We don't want to just do it in a virtual world. We want it to be in a real world. And uh, so on behalf of the, uh, the forum, we congratulate everybody in that space. Moving into uh, my brief report, I think Yarra has lived up to its reputation of being a special and an amazing place of compassion and understanding over the COVID period. We've seen the absolute best of, of what it has to offer. And uh, I want to acknowledge the work of the council. I want to acknowledge the work of the service sector. I want to acknowledge a big shout out. I know Rachel and many of her staff from the Neighbourhood Justice here, Centre are here. The tremendous work that, uh, that her and her staff have led in uh, the COVID period. And uh, it's been fantastic to see how many people have worked together so hard. And the other groups that I want to acknowledge have been the, the diverse community leadership groups, whether acknowledged or not, known or not, that have done those things in neighbourhoods and little community settings to support one another, 
without pay and voluntary capacities, looking out for each other and highlighting the, uh, the, uh, and championing the needs of their communities and meeting those needs. And the one group that I've been a privilege to be part of has been um, the Aboriginal network that is led by Uncle Colin Hunter, the Yasm meeting. And uh, it was nearly, it was really struggling before COVID. Not many people were going to the meeting, but boy, oh boy, did it find its uh, vigour and vim during COVID. And a combination of community organisations and individuals that have been meeting together in that network, making sure that elders were being fed and protected, making sure that vulnerable community members were being looked after, making sure that the message around uh, how you become infected and how you protect yourself from infection. One little example that I saw up close and personal, uh, by the way, nothing to do with anything I did. I was just privileged to observe it. I think it was an amazing example of Yarra at its best. And if there is a cautionary tale here, it was in the question that Hing asked of John Fain. Let's not forget the lessons we've learned and let's not go back to the way things are because the people who struggled before COVID will struggle after COVID. The people who are often left behind and forgotten, the vulnerable, the, the women and children who suffer silently and often un, unknown in often horrific domestic violence situations, the stigma, stigmatised drug and alcohol users that are often so reviled and poorly treated by our media and our community, the workers who are often reviled because they work with those people and we only have to look at the poor media around the injecting room over the last two years to see examples of that. And I want to applaud the work that's being done trying to bring communities together around the injecting room, the peacemaking process, that's being led again via uh, the NJC and Anita, who's in this meeting today. Really grateful for that work. I want to also acknowledge the work that uh, is being led by Ken Lay and, uh, and I, I forget the lady's name, someone remind me of the lady's name, her, her co-facilitator. Quick. Someone tell me. You're going to have to un unlock yourself. Yeah, go, Judy. Frankie, maybe. Who? And Kate. Frankie, maybe. And there's a Kate. No, the, oh, oh, the, the co facilitator. Oh, we know. Uh, Peter, it's yeah. Cheryl Battergold. Yes, Cheryl. Thank you, Judy. My apology, Cheryl, in your absence. These are signs of hope. And I think one of the other signs of hope has been the outstanding uh, group of people that have been elected to council in the last council elections. And what a fantastic thing democracy is when it works. And, uh, and I think there's a lot to be hopeful for. And, uh, and the last thing I'd say that brings me hope is the fantastic event that we were privileged to host late last year and I want to give a shout out to Deb Warner, who's in this meeting today as the uh, as the uh, coordinator and leader of APOD, and uh, a family person who has done such tremendous work in championing the cause of family members who deal with uh, um, their children and family members who battle addiction on a daily basis. Uh, to sit at the Richmond Town Hall just over 12 months ago with 100 other people and hear the stories of families as they, as they talk with such passion, compassion and pain about their journey of addiction, I can't tell you what a privilege it was and an honour it was to hear that. We must understand that the people with lived experience in the area of drug and alcohol need to have more of a say. The families need to have more of a say. We need to hear more from the people who have journeyed that path and have learnt such invalu invaluable truth and wisdom has to be brought to the fore. And we need to honour that as we honour everyone else 
that has things to offer in that space, they have often been ignored. So the forum, and Bernadette and others will talk about this a little bit later, is really is really putting front and square in our strategic plan the value of lived experience and really, want to hi- really wants to highlight that in the coming year, how we elevate that voice in everything that we do. Lastly, I would like to acknowledge a few people. I would like to acknowledge the work of the executive of the Yarra Drug and Health Forum. Um, and there are many of those that are in the meeting today. I would like to acknowledge the people who have left the executive in the past year, particularly I'd like to acknowledge uh, Jen Blatt from the Fitzroy Legal Service. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Jade Lilly from uh, CoHealth, who's uh, no longer with that organisation. And I'd like to welcome on board um, Adam from uh, the, uh, the, the Fitzroy Legal Service who's joined the executive. And I'd also like to uh, welcome uh, Janelle from CoHealth, who's joined the uh, the uh, Fitzroy, uh, joined the executive from uh, from uh, CoHealth. I'd also like to welcome um, Sarah from uh, Sarah Hilly from the uh, medically supervised injecting centre, who's joined the uh, the executive of the Yarra Drug and Health Forum in the past twelve months. But most of all, I'd like to thank the community for supporting the Yarra Drug and Health Forum in the way that it does. We are nothing without the support of the community and uh, we want to increase that support. We want to increase that support through the lives of people who have lived the experiences of addiction and drug use. We want to do, we want to increase the uh, support of the forum through people who experience the, the really difficulties of living in near and around open drug markets residents, businesses, people of goodwill that want to work towards solutions to make Yarra even more livable and harmonious than it is now. We want to increase the views and the variety of views that can be expressed within that forum. Like John says, we don't mind if people disagree with us. We want to have respectful disagreement that makes us all better. We want to learn off one another. And not finally and not least, I'd like to really say what an what a absolute um, win it's been in the appointment of Bernadette Birchall as the Executive Officer of the Yarra Drug and Health Forum. We, we, I don't know what it is about the forum, but we just keep on winning touch lotto with our Executive Officers. Every time someone leaves, we think, when are we ever going to get a better Executive Officer or another Executive Officer? who's going to work for virtually nothing and, uh, and come and join us. Well, we keep on finding people and they keep on applying. So we want to acknowledge the work of Bernadette. We want to acknowledge the work of our past executive officers, but also really acknowledge the work of Bernadette in this current year and uh, say thank you to Bernadette for her hard work. And um, uh, it's just been a pleasure to work closely with Bernadette and uh, we wish her all the best in the coming year, but really acknowledge the work that she's done in the past, what, 12 months now, over 12 months, yeah. So thank you, Bernadette. Thank you, uh, Yeah, and all the the people that are here that support the forum, we really thank you. And we're on the look for new executive members. If you want to join the executive of the Yarra Drug and Health Forum, please feel free to contact Bernadette either through our website or personally through email or whatever, mobile, and have a chat. And uh, we welcome uh, we welcome new executive members. Now I think I've acknowledged everybody, yeah. and I think I've done I've covered it all. Without yeah. my ah oh, yes, one more thing. I need to thank Kevin Myers for his many years of commitment to the Yarra Drug and Health Forum, because Kevin has chosen to resign off the executive. Hopefully, he will still hang around the forum on the odd meeting, but he has to leave the executive. And Kevin, you are you are a quiet achiever with a super intellect and a massive passion for social justice and the championing of, of, uh, of effective 
community engagement and clinical practice meeting together. And you've been a, you've made enormous contribution to the executive and to the work of the forum. And we would like to thank you for that publicly. We want to do it more fully when we can meet together, but we want to acknowledge your contribution. So this is Kevin's last official time being, I think you're coming to the Christmas Zoom party or whatever we're having as part of the exec, but we want to publicly acknowledge your contribution, Kevin. And, uh, and you've made a tremendous contribution. So if there's anything you'd like to briefly say um, in response, but thank you very much, Kevin. Thanks, Peter. Um, look, I would like to say that it's been a, a long time. I've been associated with the uh, forum for 15 years now. And I, I think what, what strikes me as a, a wonderful um, process really is actually a lot of the things that people like Peter and Heng and Sally have talked about over many, many, many years coming to fruition again and again and again, held up by, as Peter said, the passion of individuals who believe that things can be different and working to it over, over not just over a few weeks, not just like you come in for a few days and make a few comments, but actually working with people and actively trying to bring people together who maybe think differently. And so the work that Hing and Peter did, for example, with the traders along uh, Victoria Street, um, they're the sort of work that nobody nobody actually sees that work, but it's it's a long-term community development approach. And I, for one, would say I've been proud to be uh, a member of just not just the executive, but also associated with the forum over many, many years. And I hope this is a, uh, a temporary step back for a while. I've got a few things I need to... Uh, complete otherwise I'm going to be failing a course I've been doing for the last five years and um, I'm not stepping away I'm just not on the executive so uh, I will be involved in uh, other ways so thank you for your kind words Peter and uh, the future is still with us. Yeah, we, uh, um, <clears throat> I was going to get you a gold watch but I saw what happened to that poor soul from uh, Telstra. Well, Australia Post. Australia Post, <laughs> and I didn't want to be publicly outed by the Prime Minister, so uh, so I restrained from uh, buying you a watch. But anyway, so uh, Bernadette, I think it's over to you now. Yeah, and I'll, I will be um, as brief as I can be. Um, uh, first of all, thank you to Peter for his kind words and other people for their comments. Um, one of the things I'd like to recognise is that there's such enormous social capital in the um, in the forum and in the uh, community of um, Yarra. It's always been impressive, um, but it's it's been an easy ride for me since I came. I've had only support and positive um, interactions with people wanting to help, wanting to partner, um, make their um, academic work available for nothing, make their, um, you know, learned opinions available for nothing. Um, it's been uh, it's been a privilege, really, and, and a joy. Um, I've enjoyed it very much. So um, I've been embraced and, uh, and I embrace it. And I'm actually, I feel it's a very worthy, um, it's a very worthy involvement for me, so I don't think I'm above it. <laughs> so, um, so I wanted to just do a particular shout out to, of course, Peter. Everybody knows um, Peter's passion and um, and his, uh, you know, amazing availability and support to me. But I also want to do a, do a shout out really to um, Nick, Nick Wallace, because he held the fort um, one day a week, God knows how, um, through before I I started and after um, after Greg. And, um, and he, you know, without Nick, um, the, I think I would have had to go when COVID struck. There was no way I was going to do online events <laughs> with my, my level of technical expertise. So um, I just really want to say with absolute gratitude, Nick, um, you've been generous and, um, uh, and a terrific uh, support uh, to the forum and to me um, going forward. So, yeah, thank you. So now my technical assistant will um, help me with a PowerPoint. This is the more, um, you know, the, the drier part of the day. Um, but uh, the annual report is available via our website, um, as is our one-pager strategic plan, which some of you have already seen, but um, just to let you know that that is available there. Um, and I'm just going to do a little quick um, run-through 
unfortunately, there's a lot of writing. It wouldn't surprise you at all to know that the forum's very good at words. <laughs> so, like, so this is this is no different. But uh, just it, it helps me to reflect on what our actual stated goals are. So I'll just take a minute for you to read that one. If you could go back, Nick, just to that first one, yeah, because uh, I think that that's kind of like it's it's um, an important thing to remind ourselves, like what's our purpose, you know, what are our goals here, and they're quite defined, you know, so and there are four objectives that um, sit under those goals, and this was developed long before me, um, and I don't really want you to read all, everything that's over there on the left. It's in the uh, annual report if you want to, but the first objective was community education and engagement. Engagement. Um, and if you take me to the next um, slide, um, our achievements over the last year, we've done nine monthly community forums um, celebrating 35 years of harm reduction and on topical issues. Um, we opened uh, 2020 with a fabulous presentation from Vera Boston, who was one of the founding uh, members of um, Yarra Drug and Health Forum. And that presentation is on our website and well worth um, accessing and having a read through. Um, and we, with COVID, we hit having to come online. And I think it was an amazing achievement to do that. We did drop the ball on one forum. We weren't ready in April to, um, to go online, but we've since then been online. And I'll be very pleased to not be online for some of the time, at least. Um, so uh, the second objective was about collaboration and partnerships. And so many uh, organisations like City of Yarra, like um, Nudwood Justice Centre, they're, they're so um, active in uh, leading and supporting collaborations and partnerships. It's been a very easy um, uh, thing to... Uh, put to people um, to join us on uh, things that we want to lead with and for them to ask us to join them on things that they want to lead with. Um, it is a band of um, a band of brothers or band of brothers and sisters. So, um, so the next, our achievements in that really have just been um, uh, staying in the game with um, uh, NJC and the COVID-led partnership, which has been a um, significant uh, initiative during this time, and the subgroups of that, which is the Community-Led Initiatives Project Working Group and the Vulnerable Youth Working Group, which have each um, been getting on with um, you know, harnessing and building community capacity in these areas. The Yarra Mental Health Issues Group, which Kevin, um, you know, was a supreme uh, facilitator of. Um, I don't know if you're going to keep, you're not going to keep doing that, are you? <laughs> and, um, but anyway, that was, that's, that's been a, um, a, you know, a really um, a good group for me to connect with and make connections across AOD. Um, and the Yarra City Council with the local reference group and the um, local law eight or public drinking uh, issues. And it's just, I've just reminded myself um, that I meant to thank um, uh, Vada um, and Sam and his team um, earlier on. They've been incredibly support. They are incredibly supportive of um, the Yarra Drug and Health Forum, uh, very generous with their time and resources. And I just um, realised I hadn't given a, a shout out about that. So Sam, if you're still on the line, we're very grateful for your um, support. So the next objective, and that's another collaboration and partnership, um, was about service delivery and improvements. And um, that was, uh, we, we'd had a review um, between my appointment and Greg's leaving. There was a review, I think it was called the Ronstadt Review, and there were various stakeholders interviewed around that and there were various recommendations put to strengthen um, the uh, Yarra Drug and Health Forum and position it better. And uh, those have all been implemented, you know, new terms of reference, um, looking at the uh, executive committee and who we want involved, reaching out to different to get more diversity in the base. So, um, you know, we uh, and the main improvement really has been the revamped website. Um, so thanks to Nick uh, for that. Um, uh, the last one is about advocacy. And for the last 10 years uh, or so, advocacy has really been around getting the establishment of the 
um, safe injecting room. So um, that has been a, a very key focus of the forum. And now we're kind of we've we've had the opportunity to um, have a look at well, what are the current issues today and going forward, and where's our best add value to this? And Sally will talk in a minute about the um, strategic plan or the one pager for the next year that we've all been involved in developing. Um, and that's where our kind of advocacy really um, the shape that it will take, which is about elevating the voice of people who um, inject drugs and um, people who are impacted by uh, the use of drugs in the city of Yarra and um, addressing stigma and discrimination. And I think that there'll be um, a really good context for that, um, maybe with the um, Addicted Australia um, thing that I think is screening tonight. There seems to be a lot of um, uh, supportive um, uh, media around um, addressing stigma and, and discrimination, which we can, um, you know, uh, ride, ride with and complement. Um, so that, I think, is probably um, uh, the achievements that we had in that with, I think, the peer-based harm reduction, you know, looking at uh, the value of the peer workforce is something that is only just starting as, a, um, as, as something that we need to be working on and developing on, but we did kick off with that um, in, in the context of, um, uh, you know, some real challenges to that work in, uh, in North Richmond and, uh, and in Yarra. Um, and so we look forward to kind of building on, uh, building on that and getting the recognition and support for the peer workforce because it is, um, you know, absolutely instrumental in being able to achieve the harm reduction that we want to achieve. So I think that's all I want to say and just commend you to the report, which is um, uh, a, a little bit more detailed than that. And um, I just want to, I, I think I've said uh, my thank yous and um, that will be it from me. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's got any questions. I, I reckon, Bernadette, we might go to Sal. Is that yeah. okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so, Sally, you're are you going to uh, you're going to speak, aren't you, rather than the video presentation? Uh, to Sally, I, I have Sally's video presentation ready if needed. I, I think I think that um, Sally's supporting her mother with some meeting. Oh, okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you play that, Nick? That'd be great. Cheers. Yes. I'd just like to start by reflecting on where we're up to this time last year. The forum had just completed a review of its activities. This is something that's happened on a number of occasions during the forum's nearly 25 year history, and it's allowed the forum to reinvent itself to make sure that it's still relevant to the local community and the local issues. This year, the executive committee uh, undertook a strategic planning process to put into action some of the recommendations from that review and to build on what it is that we would be doing going forward. We needed to make sure that we were building on our strengths. So I'd just like to reflect, reflect briefly on what those sort of strengths are. Firstly, from the very beginning of the forum, we have always worked to make sure that we bring a diverse range of views together and encourage people to respectfully listen to each other and work to find mutually agreeable solutions to the issues that are impacting on our community. That's something that we are committed to continuing to do. There is also a lot of goodwill that uh, the forum relies upon to, in, in order to achieve its goals. And we recognise that working collaboratively with many organisations and individuals has enabled the forum to achieve much more than you would expect it to do with the amount of resources that it has. In fact, many people who don't know the forum very well think that it's quite a large organisation given what it achieves. Whereas really it's three days a week of an executive officer's position, plus the ability to work collaboratively and the time and commitment that many organisations and individuals make to its work. So going forward for the next couple of years, we will continue to work with other organisations who are working on the issues that impact on our community. We think that working collaboratively, we get the best bang for our buck and we achieve the most that we can. 
And we know that there are many organisations who are working very hard uh, to address issues in this community. Secondly, we decided that there are a couple of pieces of work that we felt the forum should be leading. Not that it, other people shouldn't be involved, we want to work with other people as well. The first one of those is that we will continue to address the impacts of drug activity on our community. And we're doing that by thinking about harm reduction and the principles of harm reduction, not just being about working with people who are using drugs, but also looking at the impacts of drug activity on the whole community and working with the whole community to minimise harms. So we will be working to listen to and work with community members and listening to and working with people who are using drugs. And we hope that we will be able to have some really good discussions to come up with solutions that everybody is comfortable with through that process. The second piece of work that we're going to do is to be addressing the issues of stigma and discrimination that are experienced by people who use drugs when they try to access services, when they're participating in our local communities. These things create enormous barriers for people being able to make sure that their needs are addressed and that they are living healthy lives. There is more detail about this in our annual report and I hope that you'll have a read of it there and I hope that this has given you some sort of an overview of why it is that we've decided to work on the things that we are, are planning to uh, put most of our energy into in the next little while. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, you can see why we achieve a lot at the forum because we had people like uh, Sally and others on the on the executive. Um, I'd just like to thank Sally for that presentation. And also uh, Sally and Bernadette did a lot of work together um, on, on producing and getting into shape the whole uh, process around developing our strategic plan, which made the work of the executive pretty easy, actually, when it came to the discussion. It's easy to talk about stuff and have other people go away and, and turn it into a Ferrari. So... Um, it's, uh, we, we, we were very fortunate. Look, we, we, we set some uh, time aside for our questions. I'm not really sure that we're running to that stage. If anyone's got a burning question, happy to take it. I've got a couple of things that I want to say very briefly in conclusion. But I think if it's okay, we might dispense with questions because we all pretty well know each other in this group. But if there's a burning question, has anyone got, got a burning question that they'd like to ask? Of anyone here? Can't see any hands. No? Then finally, I'd like to do uh, uh, three things. Firstly, I'd like, with, uh, with uh, your permission, I'd like to acknowledge the tremendous support that CoHealth give the Yarra Drug and Health Forum as our auspice. We're not an independent organisation. We're a we're, a, we're not an incorporated organisation, co-health auspices, and uh, they've been a fantastic partner, a developing relationship over the last couple of years, three years, but they've been tremendously faithful and uh, respectful in that auspice role. So I want to acknowledge that. I'd like to acknowledge too the ongoing um, partnership that has deepened and grown with the City of Yarra, who fund us partially and also... Uh, the continuing um, funding of us by DHHS. I would like to say that we would like to have a better relationship with DHS than we do now. They fund us, but we don't have a super-duper amount to do with them. We would like to have more to do with them, and hopefully post-COVID we could, that could happen. So we look forward to that, that relationship deepening in the future. And... Uh, Finally, I'd like to say that, um, and, and Bernadette alluded to this, I'd like to acknowledge the work that Nick's done in uh, all the online activities. As chair, Nick, you've been really uh, fantastic in your work. I've really appreciated all your work. And um, uh, you're the easiest person, tech person, I've ever worked with in my entire life, I've got to tell you that. Oh, and, thank you. Uh, Nick does a lot of voluntary work 
in the AOD sector, uh, Media Watch, AOD Media Watch, uh, the 3CR program, lots and lots and lots of things he does, probably things I don't even know of. And uh, so I think that just needs to be acknowledged. And also I'd like to say um, both personally and organisationally, and Bernadette did say this, Sam Beyonday has been an original member of the Yarra Drug and Health Forum when he was at Fitzroy Legal Service. Sam's been a strong supporter in his role as CEO at VADA, and we really value that relationship, Sam. And uh, so thank you very, very much for um, continuing to support the work that we do and uh, your continued interest and involvement. And uh, apart from that, I think we're done. Is there anything I've missed, Bernadette? No. Haven't missed anybody? I don't think and, so. uh, we look to seeing you all in person. Um, I just want to tell you one story before I finish. I'm working with a man at the moment uh, in my job in my Aboriginal project. He's been on remand for two and a half years at Port Phillip Prison. He's nearly 50 years of age and he was a well-known person down at North Richmond. He has a... I have permission to talk about him because I'm talking about him to a lot of people at the moment. He has been ch charged but has not had a hearing in a, in a court for two and a half years to actually work out whether he has any guilt or innocence. We have got a long way to go in our justice system in this country. So our work is nowhere near done. So on that note, I bid you a good afternoon and thank you all for attending. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ben.